Joss Whedon and John Cassidy aren't the powerhouses that they used to be, but how does their beloved run on the Astonishing X-Men hold up today? We're proof! Hey guys, it's me Marcus aka The Mad Dog and we're back with another video. Written by Joss Whedon and illustrated by John Cassidy, the first issue of The Astonishing X-Men was published by Marvel Comics in May of 2004, with the giant size 25th and final issue being released in May of 2008. And things just aren't looking great for the X-Men, with tensions running high between the current members of Cyclops, Emma Frost, Wolverine, Beast and the recently returned Kitty Pride, their goal of astonishing the world seems impossible. Then you throw in a mutant cure, the Hellfire Club and the Danger Room itself targeting the Xavier Institute and it may just be too much to handle. But what if this team is just too dysfunctional to succeed? And what if embarking on this journey takes more than they could ever imagine? Jumping into the art, and this is just John Cassidy, it is absolute best. Every time I come back to the Astonishing X-Men, it's bittersweet because he hasn't been able to maintain that same level of quality over the years, but there really was something special in these 25 issues. And his art, for some reason, really makes it feel separate from the rest of the X-Men continuity. There's this realistic tone throughout, but it still manages to convey the unimaginable with such a clear level of detail and his expert use of perspective is something that often goes overlooked, and many times action would look like it was being directed, and the whole run had a cinematic feel to it. I love just looking at this book, and when I read it for the first time decades ago, I just felt like there wasn't many other titles that looked like this. And what helped this book to look so grand was just the variety of locations. Sure, the Xavier Institute looked nice and picturesque, especially when it wasn't being taken over, which pretty much happens daily, but I love seeing Cassidy's New York and Genosha and the Break World, and also just the space stations. That range of different terrains combined with the techniques that I've already mentioned just made this book have that feeling that it was always on the move and it always had something different to show you. A big credit also has to go to Laura Martin on the colours and this is an aspect of comics that I feel often goes overlooked, but by god is it amazing here. It's not an overly saturated palette but it just does everything right. And I think the blame falls on her and John for Colossus being my favourite X-Man because just look how beautiful he is here. And yeah, I can't help getting distracted by shiny things. But even the way that the costumes look like they were a real fabric was phenomenal. And this is one of those books that just makes me look at those finer details. And an underrated aspect of Cassidy's style is the weight that his actions have. And I don't mean him as a person if he does something in the real world. But bigger characters have more of an impact in a fight and they can deliver more force. And lighter characters fall in a different way to the heavy ones. And even the hair reacts to motion in a way that I don't often notice in other books. And I guess to boil it down, what I'm trying to say is that his art just creates a great atmosphere. But it's not all glowing unanimous praise because as much as I like that detail and the colouring, there were some character faces that looked CGI'd. I can't really think of a better word. There would sometimes be this plastic, oily aspect to them that just didn't look right and it could often throw me out of the book. On top of that, for as good as he could illustrate some reactions, there were others that just felt like they were default. I noticed a few characters would just have the same screensaver look going on. The jaw would just be hanging or there'd be a vacant look in their eyes. And I noticed myself getting into the habit of spotting this more the longer the run went on. But this is still one of my favourite X-Men books to just flick through and look at, which I know is probably blasphemy to die-hard X-Men fans, but the one thing that I notice in common with devout X-Men fans is that they seem to hate a lot of things about the X-Men. I don't hear them talking a lot about the good, but the Astonishing X-Men is just super accessible and it's the reason why I think I resonated with it when I was so young. I had no choice but to get the Omnibus when it first came out, and this was actually the book that turned me around on this format. It's the reason why I hope this comes back in print so that everybody can experience this in the best format. And if it does come back in print or you wanted to treat yourself to any other books, why not check out the discount codes that we've got with the channel sponsor, Organic Price Books. They've got great packaging, fast shipping, and amazing customer services, and if you use code woof woof, you'll get $2 off your order. And if you're ordering three or more books and you want them to be delivered together, make sure you use code woof woof, ship it together for 5% off your entire order. Don't worry, you can just copy and paste them from the description down below, and you can use these codes as many times as you like. Jumping into the story section now, and when I included this book on my Where to Start X-Men, when I was very new to this channel, I had a few people saying that Astonishing wasn't a good jump on point. Because there's a few references to some of the stuff that happens in the new X-Men, but I still think this is one of the best X-Men books you can read, whether you're an old reader or new. This was the first X-Men title that I read outside of the Ultimate Universe, so maybe I don't have the best perspective, but I went into this reading quite cautious because I know it has kind of fallen a bit out of public favour now, and I worried that maybe it hasn't aged as well, but even with that in mind, I still love this run. And what I always forget is just how insane the pace is, without it ever feeling like there isn't ample opportunity for key 
character moments and I flew through this book in just a couple of readings. Because a barrier for me when I was growing up with the X-Men was just that there was way too many members. And I felt like I'd read one X-Men book and there'd be people I didn't know and then I'd jump into another and I was still a bit confused. And even going back to this title now, it still feels like a breath of fresh air. I didn't really appreciate this when I was growing up, but it's great just reading an X-Men book that doesn't need to pause itself every couple of issues for some kind of event that's going on. Or require me to read eight other X-Men books that were coming out in the same month. There's just astonishing X-Men and there's a complete story for you if you just want to read this. But when I reviewed House of M last year, I still knew who these characters were and at which point they'd been plucked out of. And I have to respect its commitment to telling the story that you wanted to. And almost pretty much giving a middle finger to the rest of the Marvel Universe. It doesn't care if you've got a civil war going on. If you've got a World War Hulk, deal with it on your own. And admittedly, that was probably a wise decision in hindsight because of how delayed some of these issues were. Kitty Pryde was the clear star to me and we'd have made the smart move of making her our perspective when the book began. It was a reintroduction into the Xavier Institute and now that I'm more versed in the X-Men universe, it's nice seeing her step into the teacher role. The hostility between her and Emma was fantastic and there was this sense that anything could happen at any time between them. And more so, I just appreciated that for once a reformed villain of the team wasn't completely forgiven. Like, let's be honest, the majority of the X-Men members have gone against the team at some point, yet no one seems to second guess it. And because of that, and also the reveal at the end of issue one, it made Emma one of the most fascinating characters to watch. But the smartest move that we'd have made with her character is reminding us of who she really is. That she is this person that we should really be keeping at arm's length, but instead she's in bed with the leader. And not the Hulk villain, that's a book that I don't want to read. Speaking of which, Cyclops was great in the beginning of this. I do think he fell off a bit towards the halfway mark, especially during the Hellfire Club and the Breakworld arcs, but early on it was fun getting to see him be a real leader without the constant reassurance of Professor X. That authoritative approach that he took really reminded me of the Scott that I saw in Avengers vs X-Men and House of M, whereas in earlier X-Men stories it always feels like he's more of a prefect than the guy in charge. But like I said, after the halfway mark, he takes a bit of a backseat and only really appears for a big moment or two, and overall he just doesn't feel as important as some of the other members. But I believe a very smart move was to not make this all about Wolverine, and some people might hate me for saying that, but they still had him as a prominent member of both the Xavier Institute and the X-Men. I do feel like there were some shortcomings with Logan, especially during the Hellfire Club story, but they put him into one of his best roles as a mentor to a younger mutant. And that doesn't diminish his presence, he still got amazing action scenes and he got to do the fastball special, so he was still Wolverine at his core, but he didn't become yet another book that was pretty much Wolverine featuring the X-Men. I do wish that Beast had more of a presence throughout this run. Whedon did a great job of balancing all of the members in the opening arc and it was where Hank got the most chance to shine. Having a founding member of the X-Men be conflicted towards this cure and not sure if they themselves should take it or if it's something that shouldn't even exist made this a far more interesting story than if they just said that it was bad because it hurts mutants. The debate it brought up between Hank and Logan was interesting as well, and the added element of Beast having the second mutation at the same time was great. And I liked how it even put me in a situation where I'm wondering if this would have been the best decision for him. But it is just a shame that after the initial arc, he pretty much just becomes the science exposition guy. And spoilers for a 20 year old series, but Astonishing X-Men is the reason why I love Colossus so much. His entrance made it feel like he was supposed to be a core member of this team from the beginning, and the journey that he went on and how integral he was to the finale of this story, along with his and Kitty's relationship being the only romantic duo that I was actually rooting for, meant that a lot of the greatness of this run and what I love about it the most was because of Colossus, yet I don't hear many people talking about him. And thank god he was in this, I still think it would have been entertaining without him, but if he wasn't in this series when I was as young as I read it, who knows if I would have still developed bigger X here and just constantly feel like I'm puny. But one element of the characters that I did find myself wanting more from was the villains. Ord, Danger and the Hellfire Club did allow for interesting stories to happen, but just considering how focused it was on having a smaller X-Men team, I just would have liked if it could have incorporated a Magneto or more from the Brotherhood of Mutants or maybe somebody like a Mr. Sinister. Like it doesn't ruin the enjoyment of the series because in case you couldn't gather already, I quite like this run of Astonishing X-Men, but I just think it could have elevated it to that next level and prepared me more for the X-Men universe when I was a new reader. In saying that though, I did love how at first each villain felt like they were just going to be the nemesis of that arc, but Whedon carried them forward so they all tied back together at the end. And not doing so in a way that he just felt like he didn't know what to do with the character, he always felt like there was a plan going on. And with him mostly being a TV show writer before this, I think it really highlights his strengths to be able to have a story going on episode by episode, but also plot things out for a full season. This, along with what I spoke about in the arc section, really made it feel like I was watching a TV show. It just gave me that feeling as I was going through the run that everything that I was reading was going to matter in the grand scheme of things, and you don't really get to say that too often. But I also just like how much personality there was throughout this series. It's become a bit of a meme now when we think of the MCU and all the quips that seem to be happening all the time, and sure, 
an astonishing X-Men, it doesn't always feel in line when a character like Emma Frost or Beast is delivering some kind of quip, but 9 times out of 10 it doesn't feel as awkward in this. I know what a monumental compliment that is for me, but I do feel like the Whedon style dialogue that a lot of people are negative towards now does work well in Astonishing X-Men because it is balanced out. It isn't a constant joke fest, but when it does happen it feels like it's at the right moment. But I don't think that this series is perfect and it's weird because there's nothing that I feel is outright bad, but there's just a few times where it seems to trip over itself. For example, the last arc in the break world was a bit of a slog until we got to the finale, and it's just more confusing than anything because we'd already established this prophecy and this conflict had been going on throughout the entire run, so I don't really know why it needed to slow itself down here. And considering this is supposed to be the big crescendo for the story, it does just feel like we're following a few separate plot lines and it never really has much overlap. And even worse than that, the storylines just seem to be waiting around for the plot to happen. And it's a bit disappointing because when the plot does decide to happen, it's really entertaining and it's what I expect from this series. I just wish it would have been a bit more consistent leading up to that. I also wasn't a fan of the Freaky Friday style personality swaps that happened during the Hellfire Club arc. Maybe it's just weird and relying on one of the most cliched plot devices in TV show history, but it really overstayed its welcome, having Wolverine being this cowering child and Beast being a literal beast. It was funny at first, but I was glad when this was over. The only saving grace of it was that it really gave Kitty a moment to shine, and also homage one of the coolest X-Men moments. But I think they still could have done that without needing to drag this on for so long. And I can't like to use a TV show metaphor again, this definitely felt like a filler episode. Also, they introduced this character, Agent Brandon, to the run, and I'm not sure if there was some kind of behind the scenes thing happening, which is why she was forced into this so much, but I didn't enjoy the majority of her scenes. Early on, we get a moment of Cyclops talking to Nick Fury to remind us that the wider Marvel Universe still exists, and that they still pretty much hate the X-Men. But then it felt like they knew that they couldn't bring him back, so they just made a space version of him. Agent Brand could have been more interesting if they'd used her a bit more sparingly, as it often felt like the sword storyline was there to just remind you that Ord existed. But if anything, I just felt like it took too much time away from the X-Men with very little payoff. And it's weird because the last Marvel run that I reviewed was Venom by Donny Cates and it feels like Agent Brand is just the adult version of Dylan. Yet I even have to eat my own words there because he did something in the last issue that actually made me quite a fan of Agent Brand. Despite those earlier problems that I had with the character, they left her in a position where I wanted to see where her story was going to go. Additionally, despite I would recommend this to a new reader, there's some references in this that haven't aged as well as the rest of the book. Like, I know she was never really anyone's favourite person, but why did Marvel just keep bagging on Paris Hilton during this time? I thought that was just an anomaly in Matt Fraction's Iron Man run, but nope happens here as well. The one thing I can say is that whilst a celebrity appearance feels forced, the ones from the other Marvel Universe characters don't. And it's done so in a way that still manages to surprise you because it's not like what they do most of the time where they slap the characters on the front cover. You'll just be going through the issue and then all of a sudden, bam, there's a Fantastic Four. Or Spider-Man might just show up when you least expect it and it's great because you get to see them done in Cassidy's style. But the way Whedon incorporates them is done so in a way to remind us that the mutant side of the Marvel Universe isn't so separate from everyone else. And I think what I keep coming back to is just the emotional core of this run. The stuff with Colossus is what guides us through this book, along with how Kitty copes along the way. And I feel like the people who don't like this run probably just don't resonate with that as much. It is a much more smaller, focused X-Men story that doesn't really involve a lot of the family. So I think that is probably going to be the deciding factor on whether or not you like this. Because maybe you do wish it was other characters that were getting the spotlight, and admittedly it is a risky move. At least it is in my eyes if you're just going to zero in on a couple of characters amongst this massive roster. But because of who they chose and how they utilised them, it's the reason why I love this story. It's also the reason why there's a massive holy fuck moment in the last issue. Don't worry, I won't spoil it here, but it always manages to catch me by surprise because I leave it a couple of years between readings. And I like that it gives this bittersweet feeling, it feels like a cliffhanger at the end of a season. But at the same time, I still feel like this story is complete. And sometimes it's worth hearing the criticism of this so that I can go back and read it again and witness this jaw dropping moment. Because there's been a few runs on this channel that I've reviewed and they might start off strong, but they may lose steam towards the middle or just straight up have a rough ending. And although there are a few lulls in the Astonishing X-Men, I still think it's a great read start to finish. So maybe I'll get some backlash for defending Whedon's writing on Astonishing, but when I separate the creator from the work, it's really hard for me not to have a great time whilst I'm reading this. This is my final verdict. 
And I believe in most cases, a property should be allowed to stand on its own two feet regardless of the later actions of the creator. I am hoping that it's just the vocal minority that shits on the Astonishing X-Men because I've revisited Whedon and Cassidy's rendition of the mutant superhero team countless times, and I've enjoyed it more so after every single reading. The stories are frantic, exciting, yet meaningful, which means that after the 25 issues of this run are done, you feel like you've gone on a journey with these characters, in a way that often doesn't get to happen with a monthly title, or you know, biannual with how this was published. It has a great emotional core, unforgettable moments, and an art style that's so good that it becomes my default version of some of these characters. If it wasn't for this run, I don't think I'd be as much of a fan of the X-Men, and I hope it continues to introduce new readers to this fantastic part of the Marvel Universe. And I'm not trying to sit here and condone any of the things that Joss Whedon has been accused of, I'm just judging it on the book that we've got here, because it is fantastic. Is it textbook X-Men? Maybe not, but maybe that's also the reason why it stands out so much. So yeah, I may get some backlash because of this, but I'm going to give the Astonishing X-Men a very high score of 85%. Woof woof! So, that's the video, hopefully you enjoyed it, but until next time, just make sure that you stay safe, and stay mad all you dogs! Woof woof! See you the next video!